you're probably be interested to know some additional testing I was involved in with marijuana in the early 1990s. Um, the Department of Justice in Sacramento uh, had a criminologist who had supervised the collection of samples, blood samples, from drivers stopped for looking like they weren't driving right. And out of, uh, it turned out that 11% of them had some THC in their body. They were also drunk, but... So uh, the Department of Justice wanted to know just how big a um, danger is this to have people who smoke marijuana driving cars and we don't have any test for that and, uh, you know, isn't this going to create more problems if we ever let people smoke? Well, we tested 40 volunteers under double-blind conditions and all the proper um, precautions against bias. We drew blood samples. We, uh, after alcohol, nine, no, seven ounces of vodka at eight o'clock in the mo nine o'clock in the morning in a 20-minute period, and a marijuana cigarette supplied by the government with 18 milligrams of THC alone, together, and me. There's the four different conditions, and they came back four weeks in a row. Well, then they were tested on the driving course that is provided for the California Highway Patrol, high-speed chase course right there uh, in Sacramento. And uh, they were, they were uh, watched by CHP officers as they drove around in accordance with the instructions they received. And then we tested them indoors on some tests of mental function, including time estimation. Well, it turned out that alcohol degraded their driving performance, particularly steering, but marijuana did not, appreciably. And when given a combination, the diff there was very little difference between alcohol alone and alcohol plus THC. If anything, THC tended to counteract some of the alcohol effects. Um, so the conclusion we reached was that marijuana per se was really not a major problem on the highway. Of course it could be if you smoked too much or took other drugs along with it. But that study never received much publicity and uh, it was never published in the open literature. Our contract ended, it was published as a big, thick, unreadable document, just like the uh, marijuana commission reports for Nixon and, and uh, Reagan and so forth. You know, Tom Ungerleiter, a friend of mine, and, um, he's told me all about it, and I've read their reports. They concluded that marijuana was not really dangerous, just as all the commissions going back, you know, the Hemp Commission and the Guardia Commission, and, they all do this work and they come up with the same conclusion and it's not a big problem and the government throws those things in the trash can and goes on with its business and fighting the drug war and doubles the number of people in jail and so on. So. so it's a bit, bit disheartening. Um, I've made it clear that I'm in favor of decriminalizing marijuana. I think save the government tens of billions of dollars for one thing to go into the uh, economic crisis <laughs> and stop giving it away to the drug lords in the other countries and paying people to kill them and other people to guard the prisoners and it's an industry in itself and of course the drug companies don't want marijuana to take the place of any of their painkillers or other drugs so they're, they're going to lobby against it and there's a whole bunch of people that really uh, would lose economically if marijuana were legalized. And I think this works its way up into a political situation where voters are involved. But there is some progress being made, I think, and I'm encouraged by that. Anyone wanting to read specific reports on specific drugs done in 1964 or something, even though they were declassified, are now restricted. They're sensitive. There are all kinds of words you can use to make it uh, 
unavailable, even through the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, a number of the people in the Sunshine Project, which is opposed to the warfare, uh, complain bitterly that the government is withholding these documents. Well, they don't have any complaint now because I put all that information in my book. Why shouldn't they be used? In fact, it's a crime not to allow them to be used. They might be helpful. Marijuana certainly is. LSD is for some people. If used on, given under the right circumstances, it can be very helpful. Uh, yeah, there's some bad trips, but those are rare, relatively rare when they're done in a proper atmosphere with proper intent. And many people claim that LSD experience changed their lives for the better. They saw things in a better perspective. Now, another interesting a sidelight on that is um, the two individuals who made the LSD back in the hippie days in San Francisco, um, one of them was um, Tim Scully, and he the was, and, and the bear, who was, whose real name is Stanley Owsley, both bought copies of my book. He's, Owsley's in Australia. He's been on the run ever since. He never did get put in jail, as far as I know. Tim Scully was put in jail twice in federal prison for 20 years, but he got off early by doing good things in the prison, and we went to visit him uh, twice. And he wrote, gee, I read your book, and uh, I liked it, and, and um, I liked you, strangely enough, I feel I know you, and so we began to correspond, he's been a big help ever since, and then this uh, Stanley Owsley, um, he doesn't like Stanley, he calls himself the bear, and uh, he's kind of a, a curmudgeon, you might say, he's a bit, <laughs> bit skeptical and cynical, but he wrote to me and he said, read your book, well organized and well done, and I'd like to talk to you sometime when I'm in the States. Well, it didn't happen yet because he was rather ill, but you know, it's so remarkable that I would meet and he become friends with yeah. these two guys from the hippie day. And then that's happened with other people. People who did research of a secret nature say, well, we did read secret research, but I was afraid to talk about it until I read your book. Since so, so someone seems to object to your book, I guess they won't care if I talk about some stuff I did. Um, Mark Emery um, carried a 4,000 word profile about me and my book. Yeah, Martin Lee wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee and Schlein wrote Acid Dreams, they had some not too complimentary things to say about the army in there, but when they read my book, at least uh, Martin wanted to come over and talk to me, and he did several times, and he started to record our conversations, and he ended up uh, being commissioned to write a 4,000 word profile with lots of pictures and appeared in cannabis culture, I have a pile of them here. Mm -hmm. And it was picked up by our local newspaper, North, Be uh, North Bay uh, Bohemian, Bohemian, with me on the front page. Another Martin, Martin Fermansky, who wrote a book on chemical warfare, and he's not exactly in favor of it, but he read my book and he said, well, I, I see the point of your non-lethal stuff. And so he became a friend. He came over to my our place in Woodland Hills a couple of times, he even came up to Tehachapi, which is two hour drive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's helping me now, he's writing a review for me. So <laughs> I've co-opted a lot of the opposition, you might yeah. say. You know. I think the reason that I've been able to do this, sort of make a bridge across the aisle, as mm -hmm. they say, reach across the aisle, uh, is because I don't try to paint anything with any propaganda. I just told the story truthfully, my experiences. I mentioned a few of my opinions, but I'm, I'm not you know, putting this out as a, a book to persuade people of anything. I just think it's a subject that should be known to the people in general and open for discussion.